said. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible with you, we will be in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And I want you to know the graphics here are worth the price of admission. These are the best PowerPoint you'll ever see. Actually, that's a joke, by the way. Uh, PowerPoint is from 1997, but it still works. So if you're keeping notes, we are in our fourth installment of this, uh, the series The Church Is, today in Ephesians chapter 4. Why are we doing this? What, it's, what is it about, Pastor? How does this apply to me? Great questions. First, it's about us as a church here at Tower View. The church is reminding ourselves about what we are called to be as a body of Christ. But you're also individuals, you're also families, and this affects us at all levels at all times. Secondly, if you're visiting, this is not how we usually preach. Uh, we usually take a, a book and go through it almost verse by verse, phrase by phrase, the best we can. We exposit it, expository preaching. But we're, we're nitpicking different things because we want you to see what the church is. This is where we've been, Amy, if you don't mind putting the next slide up, the last, I think, three weeks. We started off that the churches where the Lord's commands are followed, the Great Commission, where we go out into the world to share the gospel, wherever we are. And secondly, a couple weeks ago, it's the churches where God built his kingdom. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Did you know COVID has nothing on God's kingdom? Did you know that? Amen? Some of you aren't so sure about that. Think about that for a minute. Thirdly, the church is where people are cared for, where we want people with compassion and evangelism and prayer to come to know Jesus Christ. And that's where we enter our fourth thing today. The church is where we are one in Christ. Now, I'm preaching to people who, we have a church fellowship here, and I just want to speak frankly on this. We have a church fellowship that over the last year and a half during this COVID period has been very, very unified, at least on the surface. I never know everything, but I think our church as a whole has been very unified. You have come together. You've, you've, you've been willing and, and more than able to come and do church outside, church in your car, church online, church inside. We've kind of done it all. And so here we are, and we are one. But I want to remind you today, before we read Ephesians chapter 4, that that unity is very fragile. One bad thing of something can easily break apart that unity. And I'm going to mention COVID a lot today because I just want to beat this drum here. We are not going to let whatever decisions we make as a leadership divide our church or separate our church. Amen? We are not always right. We could be wrong. But I want you to know that as you come to this text, as you think about this passage, this is our prayer for our church. This is a prayer for our churches everywhere. Because, friends, we are entering a season once again where there's a serious health crisis going on. And there's also a serious spiritual crisis because you know what's going to happen in the coming weeks. Church attendance has spiked up over the last several weeks, but church attendance is about to go down. And some people, rightfully so, for their health, they need to stay away and, and be safe. But I want to remind you that we also need to be praying that Christians are spiritually one. Don't let things, even important things, divide us in the body of Christ. It is very fragile. Do you realize that after Jesus, or uh, excuse me, after David died and Solomon died, how quickly that kingdom tore apart? took about one month. It took Rehoboam, who was a 40-year-old who was a 40-year-old kid in a 40-year-old body, to decide he liked listening to his friends more than he liked listening to the people of God. And that whole kingdom separated out into the northern and southern kingdoms. Be careful. So this passage today, we know you could preach this yourself if such a thing were possible. But I want to remind you that this carries great weight to it. Because the very weight it carries with it is the very weight of the God we worship. And we'll talk about that today. If you're able to stand today, will you stand with me in honor of God's word? We're going to, be, we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, the worship team picked out songs that uh, started in verse 3. So we're going to start in verse 1, down to verse 6, and we'll read this together. This is God's word. This isn't Fox News. This isn't CNN. This isn't the Kansas City Star. This isn't NPR. This isn't ESPN. This isn't the Olympic Channel. This is the word of God, greater, bigger, mightier, and definitely more important than anything else going on in this world right now, as important as those are in their context. Let's pray, or let's read, and then we'll pray. Paul says, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. 
eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Verse 4, for there is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Did you notice that word right there? We are one in Christ. We will unpack that. I will admit to you that we are going to be working backwards. As you study the text sometimes, you wish you had started a different place. I had always planned to do verses 4 to 6. We're doing that today. But next week, we're going to do verses 1 to 3 because that's how it works. So we're going to be working in reverse. Welcome to it, but it's okay. Today, how the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit remind us about how we are one in His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together, and we'll get into this text and look at it today. Father, thank you for our time. As we come to you, Lord, we want to know what your word says. We see it clearly here, Lord, and there's not some secret meaning here, but by your spirit, you tell us you will enlighten our hearts to know the meaning of the text. John reminds us of that, that the spirit has taught us. And in John 15, Lord, you, you said your, your spirit would search us and try us. So Lord, may, may that be the case today. Show us what we need to know, shore up what we already know, encourage us eagerly with the truths that are here. If there's any among us, Lord, where this is the first time they're hearing this, may you just bless their socks off with it, what is being said here. But but all the same, move me out of the way, move us out of the way, Lord, that you may be heard clearly through your word. Lord, we love you so much that at that cross, that it is finished, it is done, and Christ is risen indeed. We pray all this today in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Guys, you can be seated. Thank you so much. Well, I don't have a picture of him because it's probably would get you some bad vibes, but it is football season. Like it, love it, hate it. It is football season. But Chiefs fans, I'll remind you, about 11 years ago, we were not doing so hot. In fact, I have a trash can in my office. If you've been in there before, I always tell the story that I, people ask, why do you have a trash can with the Chiefs? Because 10 years ago, they were playing like trash. And that's exactly where everything needed to go. And we had a coach then by the name of Herm Edwards. You may remember him. He's a, just a firecracker kind of guy. He's actually a brother in Christ. But when it came through the tough times, uh, players were trying to play good not for the sake of the team. Players were playing good for the sake of the contract to get them out of the team called the Kansas City Chiefs. They want to get out of here. Play so good, someone else will pick you up and you'll get on the winning team. Well, this is what he had to say back in 2010 in training camp. I believe at that time we were still in River Falls back in 2010 when this was quoted. But he said this. Herm Edwards said, quote, the players that play on this Chiefs football team will play for the name on the side of the helmet not the name on the back of the jersey. Did you catch that? The players play on for the team on the, the, the helmet, not on the name of the back of the jersey. Sports are sports, and they have their place in, in God's providence. But I want to tell you, that is probably one of the best quotes I've heard a football person say outside of things about Jesus Christ. Because, friends, that's what it's about in the church as well. We don't come to church for the sake of the name on the back of our jerseys. We come to the, 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 to, together as a family of God together. It's about us. It's about us. And so many times when we come to church, we, we need to hear a word about our situation. We need to hear a word from the Lord about what is going on in our families. And that is always true. But may we never forget that what we come to do is us together. And what is the name on our helmet? It's the name that's above every name. It's the name Jesus Christ. We come here on Team Jesus, if you will. We come here on a team that's never been beaten, has won every victory, and even when they thought we were down, he still busted out into the end zone and said, look, here I am. Uh, can you break me down? No, you can't. He, he swipe swipes every tackle. He breaks down every defender, and he even doesn't even need to kick a field goal because he scores a touchdown every time he, he talks. That is our Lord in so many words. This is Jesus Christ, and this is what he prayed for us. John 17, he said, I don't ask these things only, but uh, for those who believe in me, that through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe you have sent me. Friends, the prayer of Jesus has been that churches would always be one. And this makes sense when you consider that disagreements, disharmony, and divisions among Christians have always happened. I mean, come on. Adam and Eve couldn't even get along well enough to last without eating the fruit Jesus said not to eat. And then you got Cain and Abel, and you know how that story ended. One of them didn't live to tell about it, right? This has always been a problem. 
When you get two people who claim the name of God together, there's always going to be disagreement, isn't there? But friends, I want to tell you today that Jesus has no unanswered prayers. And when he prayed this, he said in John eleven forty two, 42, Father, you always hear me. And what Jesus prayed is that we would be one, one family, one family of God. And Ephesians 4 tells us this is not based on how we organize ourselves as a church. It's not based on what our bylaws say. It's spiritual unity across the board. And this is a time where God has been preparing us, where we have to go forward as a church unified. We have to be unified in the things that matter. We have to have courage and prayer because the big idea is simply this, and Amy will put it up there, is that when we are not unified, something in our midst has become more important than Jesus himself. You ever notice that in your relationship if you're married or dating? Things are going along great and well, and you just always seem to jive, and then you have a small disagreement. And it comes out later that small disagreement was a preference or a, a, well, an unmet expectation, or you thought it would be this, or you thought it would be that. Well, that happens in the church too. But I want to tell you that Christian unity is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's a work not of human effort, but it's a work of the Holy Spirit. We could all link arms together, if you're comfortable with that, and sing Kumbaya and make a circle around this thing, and we'd all have warm fuzzies. That doesn't mean we're unified. If we're unified, we are unified around the things that God says matter most. And I want to tell you that the Lord is moving in these COVID times. Despite all the things that you hear, God is using things in our lives to make us about him. How's he doing that? Verse 4 told us, the Holy Spirit makes us one. Christ Jesus makes us one. And the Father makes us one. And friends, I want to tell you today that if we are to be one in Christ, we need to know how God is one in himself. And we're going to look at that today. I want you to see first off, as we look at this, three things that we are one on. The first is this, is that we are one in God, the Holy Spirit. Now, hold, just hold on right there. You're Baptist. Most of you are Baptists in this room. Why? You don't talk about the Holy Spirit first, right? He's the, he's the third one. But why did Paul do this? Did you notice this? Look back at verse 3. He says, we are one in the Spirit. He kind of takes that thought in verse 3. He says, just as there is one body and one spirit, but be unified in spirit in the bond of peace. Paul actually uses the Trinity formula, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, seven different times in Ephesians. And he does that using the Spirit four of those seven times to kick it off. I think that's pretty important for us to see because this is completely backwards. When Jesus said, go into all the world, how did he say it? He said, go into all the world in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But Paul says, you're unified in the Spirit, then the Son, verse 5, and then the Father, verse 6. Well, how does that work? It just works, doesn't it? He wants to remind you, Christian, first off, of who the Holy Spirit is. We are one in God by the Holy Spirit. And this is something that we need to remember. He tells us, first off, that we are one body. We are one body. The New Testament does not define the pictures of the, the church more than anything as the body. Christ is the head of the church, is what the Scripture says, and the church is the body of Christ. To be a Christian means we are under the head. We're under Christ. We're under His authority. And Romans 12 says we are one body, and we have many members. And though we are many, we are one body in Christ, individually members of one another. Romans 12, 5. And so from the day of Pentecost to the day of the rapture, there are no separate bodies of Christ. I grew up in a small town north of here, Plattsburgh. I went to First Baptist Church of Plattsburgh. And as a kid, it always bothered me because we were, we were one of the few cities, and this is a historical note as well as a practical note, we were one of the few cities in our conference as an athletic conference that had a mixed race city, literally. Like there, we were the only ones that had African-Americans, Mexicans, uh, Asians, Hispanics, Latinos, whatever. We had the hodgepodge mix in our city. Every other city was pretty classic, northern Missouri, Caucasian, 99% of the time. Always bothered me. We were first Baptist, and there was second Baptist, which was the African-American community. And I was so proud of my home pastor, Robert Shelton, who's one of my mentors. My mom still works with him. That, that kind of bothered him, too. So as often as we could, at least once a month, those two places would get together, and they'd fellowship together, and that was a start. But it always bothered me because race separated people, and it was always a thing. Why are they second Baptists and we're first? How does that work? And that's historical ties way back when, but I want you to know this. Despite race, culture, or background, temperance, or preference, we are one in Jesus Christ. There is one body. 
Our body is not better than their body. Our body of Christ is not better than that body of Christ. We are one in Christ. But he also says there's one spirit. Did you notice that? There is one spirit. He says, uh, uh, you know, look, you're a person, I'm a person, and, and, and it's true of the church too. There is one spirit, just like you have one body. The question is, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, Baptist, he's not that third uh, redheaded stepchild that the Pentecostals just dance around the aisles for. He's, the, he's God himself. Who is the Holy Spirit? He's a person, and the Holy Spirit is God. Don't forget that. But where is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is everywhere. The Holy Spirit is everywhere, and He lives within every Christian. Romans 8, 9. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. You know, if you know a Pentecostal friend, they might ask you this question. You ready? They might say, have you ever received the Holy Spirit? Do you know what they're really asking you? They're really asking you, are you saved? If you're a Baptist, or if you're a main general evangelical, usually you'll go up to someone and say, hey, have you been saved before? Which is kind of weird language. Saved from what? Like, you got to define these terms. We know what it means. Most people don't. But if they come to you and say, have you received the Spirit? What they're really asking is, have you been saved? And friends, I want you to know, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you are not saved. The Holy Spirit is God Himself. Everyone who trusts in the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit. You don't have to speak in tongues. You don't have to be baptized to get the Holy Spirit. You don't have to walk an aisle, whatever it is. When you truly trust in Jesus, you have the same Holy Spirit as everyone else across all eternity has. That's it. Well, does that mean some people have more of the Spirit and less? No, we have the same. We have one Spirit. Now, are there days that you're closer in fellowship with the Spirit, just like you're closer in fellowship with your mom or dad or your spouse? Of course there are, because you sin and I sin, and that breaks that fellowship. But let me remind you, Christian, God will never be disappointed with you. God is completely content with you in Jesus Christ, but there may be times where for sake of that relationship that you need to confess and you need to, to right those wrongs and go back to him, but he will never let you go because in the spirit, if you're in that spirit, go down to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Look down the chapter. Look down one more time. Ephesians 4, verse 30. He says to us, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Christian, never forget if you have the Holy Spirit, if you've turned and trusted Christ, you are saved until the day Christ calls you home. Amen? But what he tells us, though, is that we are one in body. So every sin against the body is a sin against the Spirit. So we must be eager, verse four, chapter 4, verse 3, to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. But also, he says, we have one hope. There's one body. There's one Spirit. Verse 4, there's also one hope. What does he mean by this? It means that we are called to one hope. It means as Christians, our aim is the same. It's to make much of Jesus, yes, but we are looking to make much of Jesus for all eternity. Our hope when we get to heaven again is Christ himself. Don't forget that. It is Christ himself. Our inheritance in Christ is not so much about what we will receive, but it's more about what we will become. And we are to live in light of that. That's why he says to live as those who are eager to maintain the body of the Spirit, a spirit, a, a, a spirit of unity in the body of Christ. Look, there is going to be division in the body. When we look back, some of you have been through some nasty church splits. I'm just going to say a word here for a minute. Church hurt is a real thing. People have been burned. People have been hurt. People have been disenfranchised by churches, no matter what the denomination I think we can all agree that's happened at some time. Even if it's a little thing that you never told anyone, or if it's a serious thing, like an illegal thing, people have been hurt by churches. But I've said it once, I'll say it again. Some people will say, well, I won't go to church because all the hypocrites are there. Oh, well, do you go to the grocery store? I'm sure you do. Do you go fill up at Quick Trip? Because there's some hypocrites at Quick Trip too. I've seen them. Just because things are bad does not mean that there's not good that God has brought forth. There is division as we look around. There's division as we look back. But there is unity when we look ahead. When we get to heaven someday, you will be surprised at the people who aren't there, and you'll be equally surprised at the people who are there. Because guess what? If you've trusted Christ as Savior, you have one body, you have one spirit, and you have one 
hope. We may not agree about the details about how we get there at the end times, but one thing is true. We know that we're all going to be there who trust in Christ. Amen? John, 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that him, that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Friends, we are one in Christ. The church is one in Christ because the Spirit has made us one in Christ. I want you to know, secondly, we're one in the Spirit, but secondly, we are one in God the Son. Now, if you have your Bible, look back at verse 5. You may not see specifically the name Jesus mentioned here. Your, your, your scripture probably says in verse 5, if you're honest, it says one Lord, right? You have that there, one Lord, uh, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and, and that's verse 5. Well, who's he referring to here? It's Christ. How do you know this, Pastor? Well, we know this because other scriptures tell us about it, but I, I want to remind you Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Who's the Lord? Of course, it's, of course the Lord's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But Paul, in, in the, being carried along by the Holy Spirit as he wrote this, he's defined the Spirit in verse 4. He's defined the Father in verse 6. The natural inclination here is the Lord in verse 5 is the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean for us? First, here's what it doesn't mean. This verse, verse 5, is a classic verse for what we call the ecumenical movement. Do you know what that phrase means? The ecumenical movement. This is often seen in small towns where you'll have uh, uh, the, uh, I just lost the phrase in my head, you'll have the diversity of churches coming together to serve uh, a group of people, and they pool the resources, kind of like a benevolence fund here, and they use that to help people in the community. It's a great thing to its part. I remember being a youth pastor in Independence over 15 years ago. It was, it, or not, it was about 12 years ago. Natalie and I were dating, and we had churches coming together, and we were going to have this big youth event, and I was trying to be the cool youth pastor back then. Still didn't work, whatever. But I tried, and I was the uncool guy with the cool guy. You know, they had the slick back hair, you know, the cool skinny jeans and the cool glasses, things that are like 12 years old, that thing. But they wanted to bring in... True story. Many of you probably saw this on the news, in the Christian news the last couple weeks. We wanted to bring in a guy named Michael Gunger, G-U-N-G-O-R. Gunger was all the rage back then. He was a former worship guy, grew up in a conservative home. He was kind of this free-floating guy. Youth loved him. He, you know, we sung his songs, you make beautiful things. Do you know that song? Gunger this week came out with this verse. And before he posted, after he posted this verse, verse 5, he said this. He said, Muhammad is Christ, Buddha is Christ, you are Christ, I am Christ, and Jesus is the Christ. We decided back in those days, because Gunger 12 years ago was already starting to do this theologically, we decided not to bring him in and pay him $5,000 for an hour show. Well, that's a good wage, by the way. Because we saw it then. And that's not patting us on the back. Twelve years later, nothing has changed. But he quoted verse 5. We're all the same. We're all in this together. Friends, let me be very, very clear. The Lord Jesus is not Buddha. The Lord Jesus is not Muhammad. The Lord Jesus is not whatever other ism. You're not Christ. And you've known me long enough. Most of you, you, you know I'm not Christ. We serve one Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. One Lord. What is he saying? Jesus is Lord. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches. Romans 12 here, for all who call upon him, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. That's what he's saying. We are one in Christ, not because we think we're all Christ. Doesn't that sound like a John Lennon song back in the 70s or 80s? It's weird. Guys, this stuff never goes away. There's nothing new under the sun. In fact, Paul speaks of oneness in Christ here in terms of one Lord, not one Savior. He says, every believer confesses Jesus as Lord is already in salvation. What he says is this. This is not universal salvation. He says there is one Lord. You have to believe in Jesus. Well, pastor, what about those people who've never heard about Jesus? That's why we send missionaries of all stripes to get the gospel out. That's why we as a church will always be about missions. Always be about going and sending, whether you're holding the rope or you're, the, you're taking the rope down. You are going to go out because this is what we know. There is one Lord. 
That's it. That's why I cannot walk, to use a local phrase, Ed Chastine in Liberty, Missouri. He's been around for years. He has a group called Hate Busters. Look, we don't want people made fun of. We don't want bullying. We want people to be kind and compassionate to each other, don't we? So don't hear me wrong. But Dr. Chastain has said in Liberty for years, and I'm going to call it out publicly from the pulpit, that it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as we link arms together, we are one in Christ. No, we are not. Jesus defines what the lines are, and he said the line is, if you don't believe in me, I cannot link arms with you in heaven. That's what it is. Now, can I serve with you for the greater good of the community? Sure. I'm not going to check someone's salvation card at the door to go rake leaves in the park to help the local park. But as a Christ-centered body, we don't lose this focus. We don't unify except around this thing, that Jesus is Lord and Lord indeed. Amen? And that's what we know. And he goes on to say, we have one faith. Look back at verse 5. We have one faith. There are two ways to take this. There's a subjective way and there's an objective way. Most instances in the New Testament speak of the, the, the subjective way. Where, for instance, in Acts 16.31, Paul said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Acts 16.31. Salvation, being saved, requires personal faith in Jesus Christ. But there are places where it's also an objective truth. Jude 3, Jude 3 says this, Jude said, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to appeal to you to contend for the faith that is once for all delivered to the saints. We have one faith. We have a, a subjective faith. You came to Christ in a different way I did, but we have one faith that its object is the one Lord. And I want to be very clear here. J.C. Ryle, one of those old dead guys, said it this way. He said, quote, unity is mighty, but it is worthless if it is purchased at the cost of truth. Unity is mighty, but it is worthless if it is purchased at the cost of truth. Christian unity built upon truth without truth is no truth at all. There are points which we are going to disagree even in this Christian body. There are important issues, and there are in-house debates, debates that we need to have to define where we stand on certain issues. But there are some points of doctrines where there must be no disagreements. Do you see that here? He says, how many faiths? One faith. Either you believe these things or you do not. I'm going to quote to you one of those creeds. Now, we're Baptist, and a creed is one of those things we don't really like to say, but I want you to hear this because you've heard it before. If you're a Newsboys fan, you have sung this before, by the way. The Nicene Creed. You ready for this? It's not full. It's not as full as I'd like to see it, but this was an early church creed. It said this, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried, and he descended into hell. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to the heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father, Almighty, from there, he will come again to judge the living and dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to say this phrase, and it's not what you're thinking, but the Holy Catholic Church, lowercase c, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and in life everlasting. Amen. If you can't sign off on that, I'm not sure you signed off on Jesus Christ. Because that's straight scripture, pretty much. We have one faith. Well, Darren, do, are, are there only going to be Baptists in heaven? Lord, help us, I hope not. And I love Baptist. Who's going to be in heaven? Well, the better question is, how do you get to heaven? You come through Jesus. And if you truly believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and you're in a local body, and you're doing everything the Bible says, then we're going to agree on those things. But he also says there's one baptism. There's one baptism. The New Testament speaks of baptism in different ways. And the baptism here spoken of is, is what's called uh, well, there's two ways. There's a spirit baptism. So, as Baptists, we don't like to talk about this, but there's spirit baptism. When you are saved, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit. And what that means is, is that it is the work of the Holy Spirit to bring you to Christ. You didn't come to Jesus because you found Jesus. You came to Jesus because the Holy Spirit found you and drew you to Christ. Now, you responded by faith, yes. You believed and repented, yes. But that's all by grace, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Baptism is not something we do. It's something God did for us. But there's also water baptism, that when someone comes into the water, we say that phrase, don't we? We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. It's a symbol of what God has done on the inward parts. But baptism is a human tradition that you can reject at your discretion. But Jesus said in Matthew 28, it's one of the very first things you're supposed to do is to be baptized. So I want to be very clear here that you cannot, there are some denominations, I think, that take this to an extreme. You don't get baptized by the Holy Spirit multiple times, just like you don't physically get baptized multiple times either. If you come to me and, and we legitimately can pinpoint a time you came to Christ, you say, I want to be baptized again to feel closer to Jesus. You're seeking a feeling as you seek Jesus. You get baptized one time. That's it. You don't need to be baptized multiple times. Now, if you were, if you were another faith tradition, let's say you were a Mormon and you came to know Jesus, we would say that's an invalid baptism because they are baptizing you in the name of someone dead in hopes that person will get to the third heaven. That's just... It's weird. But we believe that you are baptized once to proclaim faith in Christ. There are some in our Pentecostal brothers and sisters that if you are not baptized multiple times by the Holy Spirit, they're not even sure if you're a true Christian, let alone if you're worthy to be in the same building with others who are. We don't do that here. If you've been saved, you are as saved as you will ever be saved, and you are brought to the local church just like that. Oh, how easily we forget this stuff, don't we? We're one in the Spirit, we're one in the Son, and finally, we are one in the Father. Look back at verse 6. We'll close with this. Verse 6, he says, There is one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. We really need to unpack this. What does this mean? It begins with an affirmation of monotheism. It begins with an affirmation, there is one God. There are not multiple gods. There's not people who can become gods. There is one God. We read this. We sung about this, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Well, pastor, you know, Muslims believe in one God. Do we believe in the same God as them? No, we do not. I am so grateful that we believe in a God who holds us forever. I've shared with you before, if you ask an honest Muslim, if you have an honest Muslim, if they are going to go to paradise, if they're really honest, they will say, it depends. Why? Because even if you go... Surah chapter 9, chapter 9, go kill people of the book, which is a rite of passage to the way to heaven. It's what the Quran teaches, why Muhammad had a violent past when he began the, the religion. If you believe that you're dying as a Muslim and going to heaven, as you, if you blow yourself up and take people, Christians and Jews especially with you, that you're going to heaven, there's no guarantee. Because if Allah is having a bad day and he's just not feeling it, see ya, I don't care what you did for me, go the other way. Friends, our God's not like that. Our God says when we die, we go right into his presence. When we die, we are right there with him all the time. We don't worship the same God as the Muslims, guys. Never have, never will. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the difference. Amen? He's not just a prophet. Thomas, or Thomas, what was that guy? Judas didn't die in his place. He didn't swoon on the cross and pretend he was dead, and they took him to a cave, the Muslims said, and he got revived, and that's how he became back from the, the dead. No, our God died. Not God himself in the divinity, but God in his humanity died on that cross, and he bore the wrath of God so that when we who are once far off can look at him and say with him, we are yours, not by anything we've done, but by everything you've done, it is finished. That is what God the Father sent his son to do. He is the God of all gods. He's not three gods. There is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, but God is Father of all. Psalm 103, 19 says, the Lord has established his throne, and in the heavens, the kingdom, he rules over them all. That is the, our God. Why are we unified in Christ? We are unified in Christ because there's no one else I'd rather be unified with, Right? Proverbs 21 says, no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. Guys, I want to remind you of this. No government, no virus, no military will ever take the place of what our God has done for us. In these COVID times, our churches have often been so wrecked by division. And I just pray you keep praying for unity and fellowship and community here at our church because that is what is going to bring us forward. Don't let us forget that. He's also the God who is through all. What is this saying? What is, what, what's he mean, the God is through all? It means God is sovereign in every detail. 
There is no maverick molecule in this universe. Everything is to plan. And Joseph uh, testified about this. You remember Joseph? He went down to the pit. He was brought up. His brother sold him to slavery, yet he said this in Genesis 50, 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God, you meant it for good to bring about many people that they should be kept alive as they are today. God is sovereign over all. What an awesome God we serve. He's sovereign over presidents. He's sovereign over governments. Go read the book of Daniel. If you want some encouragement today, go read the book of Daniel. Read about the fiery furnace again. Read about the handwriting on the wall. Read about when they met. Let me be very clear here, whether we meet masks or no, whatever. Guys, we are going to continue to meet. And if the government comes in and says, as they have said in Canada, that you cannot meet as a church in COVID times, we are going to continue to meet. Do you know why? Daniel continued to meet. He prayed three times a day, even if it meant being thrown into the what? You remember that? The lion's den. He kept doing it. Now, we're going to do it responsibly. We're, going to, we're not going to make a show of it. We're not going to be better, you know, higher Christian levels than other people, but we are going to come about and meet as often as we can by God's glory. Amen? Governments do not dictate how we worship. God dictates how we worship. This is the God who's through all. Do you see how this unifies us together? God is greater than all. And he says also, the Father is in all. Let me be very clear here. Uh, this verse declares the transcendence of, uh, the last verse declares the transcendence of God. He's overall, but this is his eminence. This is, he's, he's in all. This doesn't mean God is in, we don't worship the pulpit. We don't worship the stool. We don't worship wood. Uh, one sister here you, you talked about, you can buy a twenty nine ninety nine idol. You don't worship idols that you make with your hands, as some people do, but God is in all. This is why no one can ever say, how can there ever be a God? There's no God. I'm an atheist. Hogwash. You know there's a God. The most stubborn people are atheists. And you know what? God can change stubborn hearts. He absolutely can. He's in that business. You keep praying for someone until they come home to know Christ because you never know. If you've got parents, you've got kids, you've got grown kids, you keep praying for them. God is able to do it. Guys, this is what unifies us. Did you see I didn't put down? It's who you voted for for the Southern Baptist Convention president. I didn't put down mission strategy. I didn't put down who or what we do with our buildings, what color we paint the carpet, what squares we put in, what doors we buy for the bus barn, all important stuff, and it's right, right? We come together because there is the Holy Spirit, there is the Son, and there is the Father. That's why we are unified today. Oh, how many churches... And I bet if I ask some of you old timers here at Tower View, how many times this church has split or people have left? You know, there's a word that goes off, and I'll end with this. There's a word that is used often. It's used in the younger crowd. If you get ghosted, you ever been ghosted before? Ghosted means that uh, someone says they'll meet you somewhere, and then they don't show up. You got ghosted, or they, they canceled on you, something like that. There's a lot of churches being ghosted right now because people are so set on their preferences that they're not willing to humble themselves to be part of a local body. They're hopping and skipping and jumping around churches to the point where it's becoming just obnoxious. There's a place for that. You pray for Pastor Craig. They've, they've gone to about six different churches since they've been out in Kentucky. There's a place to be intentional about searching for a church. And if you're searching, we'd love to have you here. But based on the local mandates and local orders, people are literally jumping to church, to church, to church. Well, I want to do this here and 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 do this here. You know what's very rare in these days? Is committing to a local body and staying there through thick and thin. When all these things we talked about are pushed off to the side and people won't see eye to eye and sticking with it through it. When should you leave a church? You leave a church when they stop declaring these things we talked about. That's you can walk out the door at the same service if you want to. But if that church is faithfully trying to preach Christ and walk through the power of the Spirit and uplift the Father, you stick with that church until God absolutely calls you to another fellowship. Most people leave churches because they're, they're not being coddled the way they want to be coddled. You know what coddling is? You know what that is, don't you? It's when you get sick. Guys, we're the worst at this. When you get sick... And you want your wife to treat you like your mama did and bring you and rub your back and bring you chicken noodle soup and all that. 
We don't believe in a Christianity that coddles people. We believe in a Christianity that God, through the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, has conquered all, is above all, and is in all. That's what we unify around. Don't ever lose that focus. Let's pray as we close today. We invite the worship team up as we close with our last song. Guys, I hope this has made sense. Next week, we're going to backtrack. We're going to talk about who the church is for, who it's not, and what we're called to do. But before we get there, we need to thank the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much. Lord Jesus, thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you. The blessed Trinity, three in one. Not three gods, not three entities. Three in one. It's mind-blowing all the same. But Lord, we thank you that this is how you revealed yourself in Scripture. All God, all powerful, all equal, all eternal, all the things yet distinct. So Father, as we pray for unity in our church in these coming days, we pray that you rally us around the things that truly unify us. It was grace in those things that don't, but we thank you that your name is going to be lifted high. And we pray for other churches. Father, this unity, this spiritual unity talked about here is so fragile. May we walk with humility and grace in all these times. Father, we love you so much. We pray all this today in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen.